And thank you for being with us for that tour de force from the front lines of the war between Russia and Ukraine. And I think I can fairly say that we've seen an absolute sea change in foreign policy in Europe just in the last year. So we were, felt very privileged to have all of those senior officials from very critical European partners and allies with us today. If you can please take your seats, we're now in for really one of the biggest treats of the day. And I wanted to introduce to you Martha Kome, who is the Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court of Kenya. And not only is she that, but she was the runner-up for UN's Kenya Person of the Year Award for all of her advocacy for the rights of children and in the justice system and her incredible work with women across Africa. And we are particularly honored here because Chief Justice Kome is the first visitor we've been able to attract to come from Africa for this important dialogue. And we just want more African participation. We want to hear more about what's going on in the continent beyond our news headlines, which are frankly quite shallow on the continent. I was in Nairobi myself just two weeks ago, and I was just astounded not only at how vibrant the city is, but at your startup ecosystem, at all of the amazing things that Kenyans are doing. And of course, Kenya is such an important partner to the United States. So Chief Justice, we really welcome you here. And there's no one better to interview you than our very own Steve Clemens, one of the great US journalists. Thank, Thank you, you so very, much. Thank you very, very much. Um, hi, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor at large of a new publication called Semaphore. And I just want to settle any controversy that my socks are flying ducks. And, and the reason they may be controversial is I was over the weekend in Slovakia. Um, I interviewed the foreign ministers of Slovakia, uh, the Czech Republic, and Austria. Uh, and it turns out that the foreign minister of Slovakia is Radoslav Kacher. And in Slovakia, it turns out that Kacher is duck. And so the other two foreign ministers were a little disturbed at my socks and thought it was unfair. But we'll just leave that there. Um, but but uh, Chief Justice uh, Kome, it's such an honor to be with you. You were the first female uh, Chief Justice of Kenya, uh, the third of, I, I don't know how to describe it, the government under this constitution of 2010, your nation essentially under the constitution is 12 years old, and you were very involved in helping to go from what I know in Kenya was just a messy, messy situation, and you were very active in gender rights, civil rights, uh, human rights, constitutional reform, uh, and I think there's never been a time in our history, and particularly the Aspen Security Forum, where there's been so much interest in constitutions, in elections, in coming to decisions on elections as a national security issue. That's why we're discussing this today. So just before we get into the recent presidential election and the controversies with that, I'd love to kind of hear your journey from pre-2010 into a legal system and into a Supreme Court that many around the world admire so much and which you now lead. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Manuela, for that very kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Where I come from, we believe in connecting through greetings. Um, Steve, when we had a small chit chat, you asked me what I would like to speak about, whether it is the constitution, whether it is the independence of the judiciary, whether it's the gender equality, whether it's the peace and security that you are talking about. And I said all of them, but I do not want to go ahead of myself let me follow your question and talk about the Constitution of Kenya 2010, which we believe is a very, very progressive charter that entrenches the independence of our institutions, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. But just having 
uh, the independence of the judiciary spelled out in the Constitution is not enough. You must have the systems, structures, mechanisms that sustain that independence of the judiciary. You must have judges who are ready to work independently. And th that cannot happen unless you have that anchored in the Constitution in terms of the tenure of the judges, which is secured. We have the security of tenure for judges. We have an independent body called the Judicial Service Commission, an independent commission that is charged with the responsibility of recommending persons to be appointed as judges. The role of the executive or the president is to appoint upon recommendation by this independent body. What happens in Kenya is there is a standard process of appointing judges. And when a vacancy occurs, like it did occur when my predecessor's term came to an end, upon reaching the age of retirement, which is 70 years, the position of the Chief Justice vacancy was announced. Then applications were invited, and I was interviewed publicly mm. for this uh, position. And I was asked how I was going to guard the independence of the judiciary, how I was going to ensure all Kenyans will access justice, and all the values and the principles of the Constitution will be protected, that the judiciary will promote and protect the Constitution, the rule of law, and ensure there is safety and security for our people. As I sat here to listen to these wonderful conversations, the whole of this morning, I have really learned a lot, but mm. I can just agree that justice cuts across the spectrum of the security that we are talking about. Uh, because you need justice for you to have peace. Right. You need justice for you to have security. You need justice for you to have uh, prosperity. And all these issues we are talking about, cross-border relations, mm -hmm. international relations, I think all of them require justice. Right. And the commitments we have made within our countries to follow our constitution and also to follow the international law and treaties that we have signed, that we would respect one another. Mm -hmm as nations, and we will work together towards building peace. But you fought hard for what you have, and I think one of the reasons why your example and the experience of Kenya is so uh, important and interesting here is that lots of governments have constitutions, lots of governments have justice systems, and lots of them, and, and, and the outcomes are sometimes doubted, trust in institutions is low, corruption is high, but somehow in Kenya it seems things are different. But before we get there, I do want to go into the recent August election mm -hmm. uh, in which the Supreme Court um, played an important role, and for those of you who don't know, we had an election outcome in Kenya that was a lot like Raphael Warnock and Herschel Walker in terms of votes. Uh, essentially, uh, the person declared the winner in, in Kenya, uh, William Ruto, won 51.5% of the vote, uh, and Odinga, uh, uh, Ryle, uh, Ryle Odinga won 48.5% of the vote, but he challenged it. He said that there were uh, shenanigans and malfeasance and that the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission ran a fraudulent election. What was really interesting to me is that in September, you issued a ruling from the Supreme Court that said he accepts the ruling even though he vehemently disagrees with the decision. And that was a remarkable statement to many of us that were looking at it. So he respected the court's decision. And I guess my question to you is he's still continuing to challenge it in various ways if you read his Twitter feed. But um, is Kenya's democracy solid? or is it wobbly? 
Uh, thank you for that question. When you ask me whether Kenyan democracy is soaring or wobbling, in the midst of what is happening in the world today, I think our democracy is not immutable. Hmm. Just like any other democracy, even in a strong, old democracy like this country where we are in. I think last night I watched some disturbing news also about Germany. There hmm. was an attempted coup. Uh, so that just underscores the fact that there is no one or there is no democracy that is immutable. It is there for us to nurture it. Ours is a very, very young democracy, but we have a very strong constitution. Uh, so what we need to do is maintain the independence of the judiciary to and trust of our people that whatever decisions that we make as a court, we are not influenced externally by anybody in the name of the executive or any authority, but we follow the law. We follow the constitution. We follow the evidence that is brought before us to make a decision. It is true, we had a very protracted uh, campaign period, and you know Kenyans, we are very dramatic. We start our campaign, immediately we finish elections. So as we come close to the elections, the country becomes very tense. Hmm. And the stakes are very high, because those positions, I think, are lucrative for the politicians. Uh, so that is why Kenya had attracted a lot of uh, interest. Again, I think we occupy a critical position in our region, in East Africa community, and in the African Union. Kenya is quite central and strategic uh, for the peace, even within uh, the region. Uh, but what I can say, uh, Steve, is that I think our people, the Kenyan people have also matured to believe in the systems mm. and structures of governance that have been put in place. Because the people who were uh, put in place to manage the elections, the election commission, are Kenyans who went through the process of appointment. And there was public participation and they agreed that this is the person we are appointing as the chairman mm -hmm. of the Electoral Commission. And these are the commissioners that we are putting in place to assist in the conduct of the elections. And they followed it through the process that took place. Uh, it is our Kenyan process. So whatever shortcomings that there are, whatever challenges that there are, it is for us to deal with those challenges. So the election took place, and as you said, the margin was small. And an election that is close is always problematic uh, because the party that loses very closely ends up with a bad taste in their mouth. Hmm. That probably it was leaked. Uh, it was stolen. There were irregularities. It's there when was... it's 70 or 75 percent that is probably stolen, right? <laughs> 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 yes. So the matter ended up in court, and according to our constitution, it is the Supreme Court that is given the jurisdiction to determine the presidential dispute. And therefore, the matter was filed in our court. And of course, all we can do is wait for the parties to file their evidence mm. and adduce the evidence. And according to the Constitution, we have only 14 days to determine whether the president was validly erected. And the difference was 230,000 votes between the winning candidates, right. uh, what you're talking about, one and a half percent. And therefore, we were looking to see whether the petitioner will be able to challenge these 230,000 votes 
to show that there were irregularities that affected the credibility right. of this election. It was mainly an election that was conducted electronically. Right. Because for us, we registered the voters electronically. They also vote electronically and then fill in. It's both electronic and manual because right. then you fill in a paper, ballot paper, which is also counted manually, but the results are transmitted electronically. Well, let me ask you a question, Justice Kome, and, and that is, and I know this is a hypothetical, which you probably won't answer, but if the numbers were reversed, if Ruto had received 48.5% and Odinga had received 51.5%, do you believe that the belief in the institution and the strength of the court in this case would have been respected in that category as well by the loser in that hypothetical, because it, it's very important, because I think one of the challenges we're having in the United States, and we see it around the world, is exactly what you said, is that sometimes people don't trust the outcomes depending on where they're at. So, you know, President Ruto was the vice president in the previous government, mm. and so a lot of people wonder, would that previous government have accepted losing? As and and would, is the Supreme Court and the legal system that you put into place in 2010, because it's remarkable, just 12 years ago, just interested in how it has become so resilient in such a short period of time. Uh, thank you. The problem with judges is that we don't answer hypothetical questions. We deal with uh, real problems. Uh, but I tend but to... But you were a little political when you were... Younger, because you were advocating for reforms, right? Uh, but I, 20 years ago, I became a judge, and therefore now I just deal with evidence and mm. pronounce myself according to the evidence, and I'm very reluctant to deal with hypothetical questions. But I tend to think, according to our Constitution, mm. and according to uh, the public mood in Kenya, now, it looks like Kenyans want to settle down and work hmm. and realize their food potential. We have so many challenges. And I think there seem to have been fatigue of, um, you know, uh, bickering, demonstrating, and fighting over and over. We were engaged for so many years to reform that independence constitution, which was mm. a colonial legacy piece of charter. And now we got the 2010 constitution after so much sweat, mm. which created these institutions and actually guarantees basic freedom, respect for human rights, gender equality, rights for the marginalized, the, you know. So it's a good constitution. The problem is implementation. And in the midst of the implementation, you remember, Steve, there was a big movement last year also to re amend the constitution, mm -hmm. and which was also struck down by the courts. Um, it is started in the High Court that declared the constitutional amendment process, which we are calling Building Bridges Initiative, unconstitutional. Mm. It was upheld by the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court also upheld that. This move. was the 2A provision? No, 2A oh, came in the 90s. I see, I see. In the, in the 90s. This is the new constitution. There was a huge... Um, campaign to have it amended. Mm. But majority of Kenyans were feeling that we have not given it time uh, to mature. We have not um, implemented it. Uh, we are lazy. Let us try to implement it. Uh, so that's where we are at, uh, saying that what we need mm. is to build structures, institutional support that encourages us to implement this constitution because it is good for our people. 
You know, I asked you uh, before, essentially, what is the secret sauce of success of the court system and the Constitution? And you said it was people-centered justice. And sometimes yeah. people-centered justice is a good slogan, but doesn't mean anything uh, unless you're able to make it maddle and replicate. This is kind of a show and tell opportunity. You know, you're sh showing and telling what you're doing so that the best practices you have can be replicated potentially by others. So what does people-centered justice really mean? I think for us in the judiciary, we have understood it to mean what it means, that the power that we execute or exercise derives from the people. Therefore, we serve the people. And therefore, the judiciary must be able to be accessible to Kenyans. And for us in the judiciary, we have developed a vision that uh, tries to reduce those principles into practical, implementable uh, programs. Hmm. Uh, for instance, for the independence of the judiciary, we are insisting that for the judiciary to be independent, we need the infrastructure, we need courts in all the areas where people are, because some areas are far from where you can access justice. Right. Some people have to travel like 200 kilometers you can imagine a child who has been defiled, and they have to travel 200 kilometers to come to court to seek justice or seek uh, government services. So we are saying we need court stations um, closer to the people. Right. And we are saying judiciary also should be allocated budgetary um, resources. Uh, to be able to execute the programs, like ensuring the courts are near the people. We have the human resource capacity that is necessary for us to be able to manage those courts in terms of the ratio of the judges and the other uh, uh, requirements like technology. Uh, we are leveraging on technology to ensure that, uh, you know, with the modern technology now, we can have virtual courts and we can have e-filing and, um, uh, you know, um, we can also deal with the issue of backlog because I think the biggest right. problem we have, not only in Kenya, but the region, is dealing with the backlog of cases. People-centeredness justice requires people to, not to keep coming to court year in, year out. It is so that when they file a case or their rights have been violated and they have come to seek justice, they can actually know that when I file my case within a year or two or three, my case will be determined and I can get a resolution. Let me ask you one, we're gonna ask you one last question and I'm sorry that we have to, to cut this a little bit short today, but the, um, we just had in Sharm El Sheikh uh, uh, the major UN uh, climate change conference, and one of the outcomes was it was sort of in, in American uh, parlay, it would be an authorization without appropriation to help governments, to help nations that were victims of climate change to pay for and you know uh, respond to those uh, issues. And I'm when I looked at it, it sort of seems to me eventually this has to be a function of global or you know, some sort of litigation scheme where governments that are victims can sue those with resources for the impact. Are you interacting at all as one of the top legal minds of Kenya on those kinds of issues with international courts? Indeed we are. Uh, in Kenya, we are hosting one of the biggest conferences in Africa bringing all the jurisdictions uh, together to discuss uh, climate change and adaptation. Um, we, on climate change, we do not think we need to sue anybody. Uh, we need to, for them to realize that um, what Africa has gone through requires uh, support uh, to mitigate the climate change. Uh, Kenya is rending in that way because we are having the first court in Africa that deals with environment 
and land. Mm. And we are working very hard uh, to see how we can have a dialogue with the other jurisdictions in Africa. Um, because climate change is something that we have to address now mm. Mm. Uh, immediately. And of course, we need support from our bigger brothers, the global community. Uh, they know what they have done to Africa, so we don't have to remind them, but perhaps uh, hold some mediation sessions. Real quickly, do you have any advice for Chief Justice John Roberts here? You know, there's a, not a more controversial subject right now than a lot of judicial decisions that are coming down, and one of the first things people act is, who appointed that judge? Do you have any counsel you might share with him? Uh, thank you very much. Even if I had, I wouldn't uh, say it here because that's my brother, Chief Justice. I met him yesterday, and we extended an invitation for him to come to Kenya. Uh, because we consider America a great uh, friend and partner, but there's always something to share with one another as uh, uh, chief justices, as judges, because there are lots of things that are good that happen in America that we admire, and there are also some things that happen in Kenya that Americans can borrow. For instance, the independent way of recruiting judges and not having to take judges through elections for them to have their uh, terms confirmed. Uh, I think um, that's what I would say. Well, I would just say in thanks, uh, Semaphore next week is going to be having a major uh, US-Africa Leaders Summit on the edge of the President's US-Africa Leaders Summit, and I plan to hold the three African heads of state coming uh, to a standard as high as yours. So uh, please give a round of applause to Chief Justice of Kenya, Martha Komek.